On behalf of the Markula Center for Applied Ethics, we are excited to welcome you all in the audience for another webinar in the Love Your Neighbor and Get Vaccinated series. My name is Amana Liddell and I am a senior at Santa Clara University working with the Ethics Center on the Get Vaccinated project. I will be hosting today's webinar along with Don Heider, um, the Executive Director of the Markula Center. Um, as I introduce today's guest, we will be sharing some slides with some images that we would like you all to take a look at. Um, as a special installment in our COVID vaccinations and back to school series of webinars, we are welcoming street artist Finch today to talk about his unique approach to combating the COVID-19 pandemic. Based in San Francisco, Finch is well known for his honey bears, which can be found in public spaces across the city, including windows, sidewalks, mailboxes, and more. During the pandemic, Finch has depicted his signature bears wearing masks and holding vaccination signs as he engages in the conversation with the community about COVID-19. Finch's art can be found in many places outside of San Francisco, from New York to Hong Kong and beyond. Finch, Welcome. We are so excited to have you here today. Um, Pleasure to be here. Yes. To Thanks kind of for joining us. kick things off and um, get a little bit more of your background as an artist, um, could you tell us what is contemporary pop art and when did you discover your passion for it? Yeah. So, contemporary pop art is a little bit of a made up phrase. I wanted to be able to describe my work in a way that gave people enough to have some idea what I did. Um, but not be too specific um, to really constrain myself. And so, um, you know, I think of, well, there's many ways to define pop art. It sort of was a movement um, with artists like Andy Warhol and Jasper Johns that oftentimes looked at sort of everyday objects and tried to lift them up into the fine art world. And that's something that I do, but it's also art that's just intended to be popular, um, sort of like pop music. But I think what I do is sort of as being in the vein of something that like a Warhol might do, but um, contemporary, you know, so it's, it's not quite what he's doing, but kind of up, updated for current tools, technologies, mindsets, approaches, et cetera. So uh, as we just saw on the slide, you're, you're probably best known for your honey bear uh, paintings that can be found all around San Francisco and other, other cities, other places around the world too. So how did the honey bear come to be and why a honey bear? Yeah, I, I wish I had some really great story for it, but basically I just saw one one day and it made me happy. And so I was like, cool, I'll, I'll paint that. Um, and it made some other people happy. And so at this point I was doing entirely street art, um, which I defined to be uncommissioned public artwork. And so I started doing more and more of them. Um, I went out like a couple nights and was painting sunny bears onto mailboxes in the Mission neighborhood of San Francisco. Um, and then it started to feel sort of too repetitive um, like I was veering from street art towards graffiti. And that's when I kind of hashed the idea of putting them into the outfits. Um, so the first one was a bear in a baker's toque um, followed by the pirate bear and sort of like a pirate hat. Um, and then it kind of went from there. And so it sort of evolved over time and it's ended up being something where it's a bit like a game, um, but, but you're kind of in on it, right? Where you, you see a new pair and it's been mixed or remixed in some sort of new and interesting way. That's awesome. Um, so kind of you have all of these bears and this, these different outfits and things. What inspired you to turn to street art in the wake of the pandemic when you began painting masks onto the honey bears? Yeah, so the very first thing I noticed in the pandemic that was compelling to me was that all of these storefronts in our major commercial corridors had been boarded up. And so, you know, I got started off in street art, but then I basically moved into murals at least in San Francisco, which I find to be commissioned public artwork um, because I could I, at some point, you know, it, it wasn't sort of intrinsic to my desires to, um, you know, to do extra legal artwork, if you will. And so, you know, I, I kind of had let that subside, but when the board ups came, I was like, well, these are the most depressing sort of outward manifestations of the pandemic, right? We've taken what used to be our most vibrant areas and we've made them just nonstop um, wood. And for me, one of the, the kind of core pieces of my art practice is to 
kind of change people's perceptions of public space and to be like, hey, board ups can be canvas, mailbox can be canvas, sidewalks can be canvas, et cetera. Um, and so that was sort of right in line with what I was um, wanting to sort of express from a, um, a like a spiritual standpoint. Um, and then also just being like, hey, you know, this is scary. We need something that's positive. Um, and so the idea initially wasn't actually to, to do, this is an idea I kind of stumbled across, I guess, like many good ideas. I went out at first, the very first day and did a couple of bears, but then I designed the mask bear, just kind of the classic bear and the mask and I did the soap bear. Um, it could be a hand sanitizer if you want, it's got the little pump on its head. And, and when I went out, you know, we discovered that we didn't want to put up any of them that weren't the mask bear. Or like there's something about this that is particularly resonant and that then hatched the idea that maybe every bear is a mask bear. So it's not Baker bear, it's Baker bear in a mask. It's not David Bowie bear, it's David Bowie bear in a mask. It's not chef bear, chef bear in a mask. And that really was the aha moment that sort of spawned this whole, I mean, that and several kind of subsequent projects to be like, hey, you know, we face a collective action problem, basically. Like we need to all kind of work together to get out of this by, you know, sheltering in place, by wearing masks, um, you know, et cetera, um, now by getting vaccinated. And, and so this idea that it takes sort of like group participation where, you know, any individual might like to defect from, from that strategy, you know, to go serve their own um, personal interest, but be like, well, we, we oftentimes face these um, really terrible collective action problems. And so, and so I just wanted to say, hey, look, the bears are all wearing masks, um, you know, and then also just kind of bring some whimsy to things as well, right? Which is like, these are really depressing, here's some art. You know, and, and and that definitely resonated with people. So as a re result of that, the, the masking of the bears, I guess we could call it, you also got a chance to partner with the San Francisco Department of Public Health and the Municipal Transit Authority. Talk a little bit about uh, how those partnerships came to be and and what the goal was. Yeah, so um, like many things, like a previous story, a lot of these things evolve. They're not sort of masterminded. And in this case, um, I now work with a publicist um, named Mark Rhodes, and he had a connection to someone working with the Department of Public Health on their um, pro-vaccine campaign. And so this was all begun before the vaccine had rolled out. And they were like, well, they'd gotten some hints that there might be vaccine hesitancy. And so we weren't sure we we're going to have this problem in San Francisco. Um, you know, we weren't sure if we did to what degree we'd have it but they wanted to sort of get some pieces in place um, to prepare for that. And we didn't really have a particular vision for how that would manifest. One of the ideas was maybe to put like, you know, um, so I designed a bear called vaccinated bear, which has like a bandaid on its arm. It's holding a sign that says vaccinated. So it's a vaccine card, if you will, um, but with all the text stripped out. So it's extremely clear what it is. Um, and so maybe you put that outside of a vaccination center so you can like take a selfie with it and post it to social media as a way to sort of you know, spread the message to other people. That was one of the ideas. Uh, ultimately, couldn't find a good wall for that. And then the um, the MTA offered up some of their remnant ad inventory um, on their digital bus stops. And then when I got in touch with them, it turns out that the woman who runs that part of the department was a big fan. Um, and I'd, I'd spoken to her. Um, she used to work for another company, and, and I going over lunch and giving a pitch um, on why they should have public art on their buildings. Um, and so she was like, okay, cool. Why don't we put it on buses? Why don't we put it in buses? And so that's how it kind of ended up working its way out into sort of more places. Nice. Great. Um, you have definitely been known kind of as a philanthropic street artist. And so one of those things that um, you've become known for is um, donating the earnings that you've made from selling your art to different charities. So what inspired you to donate earnings from online sales to supporting local efforts to combat COVID-19? Yeah, so, you know, I've always had some philanthropic component in my practice, um, and it, it usually took two forms. One was I would donate paintings to various charity auctions. So if a school or nonprofit is like, hey, you know, they have some event, Right, and they auction off some things that's be for paintings, and so um, you know that's that's a thing that I have done and continue to do. And then, really, starting with um, I did a bear called the Pink 
pink pussy hat bear uh, back when Trump sort of pulled funding from Planned Parenthood. And um, I gave half of the proceeds from that to Planned Parenthood. Um, and that was for, sort of my first, I basically got like a, let's say a, a, an encouraging text from a friend um, being like, hey, you started to build a platform with your work and like you should use it for good or something. Um, and, you know, I always had some hesitancy around doing anything that I consider to be political because putting art in a public space is a political act sort of unto itself. And I didn't want to sort of jeopardize the other goals of my practice um, when I'd already mentioned, which is changing people's perception of public space. Um, and the other one is just trying to bring art to the 95% of people who don't go to art museums. I right? trying to tie this into something that is more of a hot button issue um, can undermine those things. But in that particular case, um, and actually the case with the masks as well, the way I sort of thought about it is, is one, I, I do have an opportunity maybe to have some influence. Um, and then two, I'm not really hitting something that is truly divisive, right? I'm trying more to just like put my hand in the air and be like, look, I'm standing with you um, than I am truly trying to change somebody's opinion. Um, and so that gave me some, some comfort around that, but that sort of hatched the idea of doing what I call cause bears, um, which is sort of bears tied into causes. And one of the, the benefits I realized I sort of stumbled into was that by being so adaptable, the bears can tie into not just maybe interests like weightlifting or wine drinking, but also causes like Black Lives Matter or victims of campfire or you know women's health, et cetera. Um, and so fast forwarding in 2020, so that was the thing I, I, I had done sort of, you know, I'd done the smoky bear at one point um, for the campfire victims and um, and, and I get to the mask bear and I'm like, I would feel pretty, I just like, it didn't sit right with me to sell. Well, first of all, I wasn't gonna sell bears wearing masks at all. I was like, who would wanna remember 2020? Like no one's gonna wanna buy this. Um, but people kept asking about it. They're like, hey, can I buy one? Can I buy one? Um, and you know, I'm not, I'm a person who likes to listen when people um, say those kind of things. And I was like, okay, cool, I'll do it. But only, I'm only gonna do it if I can do it as part of, of a fundraiser. Um, and so at, at that point, um, you know, the other, the other fourth that happened is that one of my collaborators had started to sew um, masks. And this is back before you could really reliably buy masks. Um, and he found some research online about how to take basically shop towels um, and to fold them and sew them that they, were, they weren't N95, but they were N91 or something. And this is back when there was like basically nothing. And so we were, um, I was like, hey, would you consider sewing masks um, with honey bears on them if we give 100% proceeds to charity. And so we basically started production on that. Um, with the paintings, um, I ended up setting on half um, to charity, the sense of being a number that is sustainable because I have a team of art assistants and pay rent, et cetera. And I basically discovered that you can give quite a lot more when you don't go bankrupt in doing it. Um, and, so, and so, yeah, so that was basically the construction of the first mask fundraiser. And it just went like, well beyond my expectations. I think in the very first one, I donated over $100,000 um, to local nonprofits. And um, I specifically want to target things in San Francisco specifically tied to COVID. And so the two main ones um, for that fundraiser and then the subsequent one that I did were uh, the Safety Net Fund, which just does direct cash transfers to artists. Um, having studied economics, um, I like direct cash transfers. Um, you know, I think that they're, um, they don't sort of demean the recipient by trying to overprescribe what you do with it. Like if you need medicine, if you need rent, if you need food, you pick what to do. Um, and, and, and again, this was all to artists who are out of work because of the pandemic. And the other one was um, called SF New Deal. And it's a nonprofit that basically pays restaurants to make food, but then gets donated to those in need. And so it helps keep the restaurants um, alive. And then very specifically giving them recurring revenue. So it's not just like a one-time check. It's like we're gonna pay you week in, week out. So you don't have to lay off the staff or have the uncertainty of it. And then of course we have people who are out of work um, or who are in need um, who can take that food. So you don't have to sell the food on. Um, and so, you know, for me, I wanted to support, like I was seeing my local community, um, you know, be challenged and, um, and yeah. And so that was sort of, that, that, was, that was the beginning, you know, throughout the course of the year, I ended up doing a couple more. Um, I did something around pride. I did something Black Lives Matter. I did another one for COVID causes. Um, there might even be another one in there that I forgot, but, it, it ended up kind of being a thing where it's like, how I feel about it is that I, I don't wanna be like a fundraising artist that feels too constraining where it's like, 
people expect that everything I'm doing is sort of not for profit. Like I use profits to, you know, travel to go paint murals in other cities or to hire, you know, artists who um, can't sustain off their own artwork uh, to work in my studio, um, you know, things like that. Um, but it feels to me like, I mean, I don't have any kids, but I've, but I've heard this. It's like, you need to give the kid what the kid needs, um, you know? And so one kid might have more needs than another. Like 2020, if it were a kid, um, needed a lot more than 2019. Um, and probably more than 2021, um, uh, though, you know, a little bit mixed there. Um, so I'm certainly trying to keep, keep, the, keep the foot on the gas, um, you know, in, in 2021. I have at least one more big fundraiser planned for this year. But, um, but yeah, basically it was like, I saw an opportunity to help um, and I didn't want to reject the opportunity. And, you know, once I was certain, I thought at first that, you know, I would be struggling to exist into 2021. I thought that art sales were gonna go to zero. Actually art sales um, across the board went up. You know, I've talked to almost no artists or galleries for whom that wasn't the case because people were stuck at home with very boring walls and decided that art might be a good thing to have. And so once I knew that, you know, cool, I'm going to be here, but it was like, okay, like we all have to do our part. One of the things that strikes me, you know, um, you talk, you talk today and you're also on your website and you've talked in the past about wanting to make art more public oriented for the people that don't go to art, never go to an art museum. And I think about sort of the history of pop art, you know, uh, from Warhol on. And, and it seems to me that um, one of the parts of it being so public and, you know, on everybody's street is um, like when Warhol did it, you know, I don't, I think he did it because he wanted to do it and he was sort of making a statement and sort of making, taking the norm normal and making it sort of more than normal, right? Sort of making a statement with it. But, but um, at, if I think sort of about the progression of pop artists, like to somebody like Keith Haring, who was a bit more, I'd say than a Warhol, in touch with what was going on in the world and, and sort of responded with his art, responding to some of that stuff. And then I see you sort of doing the same thing. And it just, it just tells me something about how things have changed over the last 50 years in terms of social media and you know, how interactive we are, whether we want to be or not. It's, it's harder to be isolated in the world and just make art, right? So t talk a little bit about that, what that process is like of getting feedback, thinking about how to respond to it, you know, and how it affects what you do. How do you make choices about, you know, what, you know, how it affects what, what's next, what you're doing. Because even today, you talked a little bit about how getting input from people has, you know, had an influence yeah. on what you've done. Yeah. So this ultimately ends up being a challenging um, balance on the one hand. So I basically don't, I pretty much don't believe that you can make art that other people like sort of that you don't want people will like. Um, I think when you try to sort of pander in that fashion that it ends up failing. And so the model that I take, which I've heard from other people as well, so you're basically trying to make things that you like and then trust that there are other people that will like things that you like. Um, that trust uh, ultimately the hit right there is is um is somewhat low right so for me it's it's i don't um like i am i was equally excited about you know some of my images that the other images and and i i can tell you for for sure i don't know in advance what's really going to resonate um and but part of how i find out what does resonate so so that's sort of at the like genesis level is i come up with some ideas of things I'd like to do. Um, and then I kind of just do them um, without, without much input um, you know, from other people. And then I sort of like listen and, and hear. And I'm, because I wanna make art that, that, that people like, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hill climb from there, right? So if nobody had liked the honey bear, um, then I probably wouldn't have painted so many honey bears. Um, but the fact that people do, um, and the fact that I can continue to find sort of new aesthetic territory to explore around it, um, you know, continues um, my my journey in, in that direction. Um, I have an image that was somewhat popular, which are these lips that I paint, and I did them in you know all the colors. I did them with some stripes and some dots and things and squares in the background, 
And I basically was like, I feel like I have, you know, mined this aesthetic territory pretty far. Um, I don't know where else to go with this. That's not just re like too repetitive. And so that ended up sort of fading as part of my work. But, you know, I, I can give um, kind of almost endless examples of this. Like one that I, on the positive side, was I got commissioned to paint a mural of California poppies. And I actually wasn't that optimistic about the mural because the poppies themselves, the flower heads only three colors, um, which for me is on the low end. Um, you know, I'd say my average image has like seven layers to it because um, all my work is on my spray paint and stencils. And so a lot of the constraints are around basically the, um, I don't want to call it physics, but, but the, you know, the, there's a physical process to produce it that, that imposes constraints. Um, and the poppies, just like I posted on the Instagram, you know, like, here's my new mural, and people went crazy for them. It was like one of my most liked posts. And so I was like, okay, maybe I should paint another poppies mural, right? Um, you know, and, and so I did, and people like that one too. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, um, you know, that's at the most basic level, like that's an advantage. Um, what's, what's social media, and I don't need to get into this at too much length, but it has a, you know, um, very many dark sides as well. Um, you know, one of the dark sides is that you're sort of encouraged, like, you know, you're supposed to post like every day, but obviously you can't make, um, or it's hard to make a new artwork every day, um, at least in some sense. And so, you know, it, it, it encourages you to maybe be sloppy. And so you have to sort of resist against that. Um, I definitely take some inspiration from Banksy on this. So we'll just be completely silent for two months and then be like, okay, here's something I did. Um, you know, I don't have that much restraint, um, you know, but, um, and maybe I do more projects than that. Um, I have a bit of a more is more mentality, um, but, but there's a balance there. You're also just gonna get, you know, you, you have to interact with everybody. So, you know, um, you know, I've not talked to anybody with any kind of reasonable following it doesn't have like trolls basically. That was common sort of um, say very mean things. Like I, I watched an artist talk from an artist uh, who just did a piece at the, um, at the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco. And her post sort of got into some like neo-Nazi like community. And they all just like went to her page at once and just like, just like trolled her with all this like, you know, anti-Semitic um, uh, language. And, and so it was like, that's weird, right? <laughs> you know, and sort of like, okay, well, how do we deal with that? Um, and so, and so it's, anyway, so like, it's a blessing and a curse. It's, it's nice to be able to reach people. It's nice to be able to get that feedback, but ultimately you still have to have, like, it, it, it it's not a, um, you know, there's a probably a powerful quote from Henry Ford, which is if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have asked for a faster horse, right? It's like, you, you can't pander too much to it. Um, it's more of like a feedback system that like, I did a thing, you know, give me your feelings on it. Um, and then you can choose to accept or reject those feelings. You know, it, 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 it is at least an objective measure of something. Um, and then having that is sort of in some ways better than not having it. Um, and so, you know, I try to see what can I get out of that that's useful, um, you know, and then kind of go from there. And then again, sometimes people literally say like, I want to buy this, like I, a mural I did of a, of, of a grizzly bear inspired by the California flag. Um, again, didn't know people would like it. Um, not my kind of everyday object up the middle sort of pop art. Um, and people went crazy for it. And people were like, I'd buy a print of that, I'd buy a print of that, I'd buy a print of that. So I've not yet released a print of that, but now I know that over say the ladybugs that I paint, which people have not made that comment on, um, I'm much more likely to, you know, to, to work more with the California bear. So that's perhaps a long answer to a short question, but. Oh, that's good, um, thank you. Yeah. yeah that was awesome. Um, as the school year kind of starts all over the place, um, it's either about to start or has just recently started for students. Um, do you see your art kind of aimed at young people, um, especially with the use of social media, which kind of tends to be marketed at the younger populations? Yeah, so the way I think about this is, I heard a quote from Pixar once and they said, we don't make children's movies, we make adult movies that happen to have imagery um, that appeals to children. And if you've seen a Pixar movie, um, I think you can understand what I mean, that they deal with sometimes very serious topics um, that you know, uh, a small child couldn't really have, um, couldn't really understand. And, and it's fine that part of the, of the film can completely pass them by, but between you know, the physical humor and the colors of the animation and whatnot, they can still be engaged. Um, my artwork seems sort of childlike in a way, um, it is, you know, I, I wouldn't call, it's not a um, 
cartoon per se, because I think there's actually some technical definition of what a cartoon is. Um, I don't use uh, black lines around things, um, but it's sort of in, in, that, in that vein. Um, you know, again, I make things that I find appealing. Um, you know, I, I've had a long love of sort of um, this style of art. Um, you know, I've heard it referred to as like cell shading um, in the 3D sense. Even as a kid, you know, when I was trying to dabble in 3D software and whatnot, I was always looking for cell shaders and, and how to reduce things down to component colors. Um, and so it's it just for whatever reason is an aesthetic that appeals to me. Um, and then I pursue it and then it just happens to appeal um, to other people. You know, I'll say I, I, I've met a number of my fans um, and it's really a pretty wide range. Um, the youngest person I've ever seen who's actually purchased one of my artworks was 16 years old and she saved up her money from babysitting um, and then bought a painting. Um, I was not the only street artist whose work she bought. She was kind of like a street art fan, um, but that was cool to meet her. And then probably the oldest is in her mid eighties. Um, you know, and, and so I find a lot of um, older people like my work as well. Um, young families like it, you know, I, I don't, um, you know, I, I think because of its sort of positive nature as a very broad appeal. Um, but certainly I, you know, kids come to art without a lot of preconceived notions, right? They can see something and be like, I like it or I don't like it. Whereas an adult might have baggage of like, well, is the artist famous or is it, am I going to be sophisticated, or not sophisticated if I say that it's good or it's bad or I like it or I don't. And all that baggage ends up, people ultimately feel unqualified to judge what they themselves like. Um, you know, and I feel like going in art museums, the loss of the art is extremely alienating because it requires such a deep cultural context to understand. Um, and the institutions are sort of made to make you feel small um, on occasion, not always, but that certainly happens. Um, you know, that th the people end up with this um, lack of confidence about, about what they may or may not like, or they may feel bad for liking something. Whereas a kid is gonna be like, it's a honey bear, it's cool, I like it. Right, um, and so um, you know, I think again the bright colors that I use and sort of the the, the positive imagery um, definitely resonates with with younger people as well. We just have a couple of minutes left. What do you hope people take away from your art? So um, again, in, in general, what I mentioned before is I try to really stay on the art for the people who don't go to art museums, um, which again by various calculations I've made is about ninety five percent of people in Chicago, New York, um, San Francisco, et cetera. And also just really trying to change up people's perceptions of public space. Like I did this huge project last year with the mass bears and windows. Um, you know, people have certainly put art in windows before. Um, I have not heard of anything even remotely at the scale of what I did, you know, all 50 states, 18 countries, um, more than 18,000 windows. Um, I did a whole project with light posts in San Francisco where I found basically a loophole in the law that allowed it to be done in a legal fashion. I put art in outside of lift cars. Um, and I work in, in sort of slightly adjacent traditional. I've done art on staircases and garage doors and, and really, especially in a densely populated area like San Francisco or any city, um, we have so much more real estate for art that, than we utilize um, that, that, that we need a culture shift to really have those people then hire artists. Like we don't have an art production problem um, we have an art consumption problem, right? Where, where people basically need to feel like, you know, they should commission visual artists to do work in their spaces. Well, I just want to, uh, I guess we better wrap things up, but I just want to thank you so much, uh, Finch, for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, Absolutely. It, it's been a pleasure. And uh, on behalf of uh, Amanda Lindell, who's uh, one of our great Hackworth fellows here at the Markless Center, on behalf of the Markless Center, uh, thanks for uh, tuning in today. This is part of an ongoing series we're doing on COVID and vaccinations, and uh, we'll be doing more of these in coming weeks. You can find the Markula Center if you just Google Markula or Applied Ethics, you'll find us. Yeah. Thanks very much for being with us today. Pleasure to have me. Thank you.